Thank you for watching this virtual lecture event hosted by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. We also offer the opportunity to take a single course without having to pay an entire semester's worth of tuition cost. One can also audit such a course at a much less cost. If you're interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. This evening's lecture event is part of the 13th Annual Kosciuszko Chair Conference. This conference is sponsored by the Kosciuszko Chair of Polish Studies and the Center for Intermarium Studies. This evening, we'll be hearing from Dr. Marek Hodakiewicz. Dr. Hodakiewicz holds the Kosciuszko Chair in Polish Studies at the Institute of World Politics and leads IWP Center for Intermarium Studies. At IWP, he also serves as a professor of history and teaches courses on geography and strategy, contemporary politics and diplomacy, Russian politics and foreign policy, and mass murder prevention in failed and failing states. He's the author of Intramarium, The Land Between the Black and Baltic Seas, and numerous other books and articles. He holds a PhD from Columbia University and has previously taught at the University of Virginia and Loyola Marymount University. Dr. Hodakiewicz, welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. It's business as usual at IWP. I have a story for you. Thanks for watching and listening. A story about a saintly underdog. America usually sides with an underdog. When the underdog's cause is righteous, our support tends to be unqualified. Sometimes we root for a collective underdog. That was the case, for example, with America's fondness of Poland's solidarity and its fight for freedom against the communists in the 1980s. But we absolutely love to adore individual underdogs, in particular when they personalize a cause that is greater than themselves. We frown on those who persecute such a person, and we absolutely sneer at those who disrespect our underdog, whether in life or death. I have a story about an individual worthy of our support. He consistently defended minorities, including Jews. He opposed both Nazis and communists, and he refused offers to exfiltrate him from his homeland, suffered arrest, imprisonment in the Soviet Gulag and a Czechoslovak communist jail where he perished. And now he cannot get respect either in the land of his birth, which is now the Slovak Republic, or in the place where he died, which is now the Czech Republic. A son of a famous aristocratic family, Count Janos Eszterházy, born in 1901, died in 1957, was born in the kingdom of Hungary of the Habsburg Empire. A son of a Hungarian father and a Polish mother, Countess Elżbieta Tarnowska, he was old school. His bywords were my station and its duties, we serve a cause that is greater than ourselves, and we are blessed more than others, and thus we have a greater obligation to serve the people. Esther has certainly lived all his life by such old-fashioned strictures. Everyone was a child of God in his eyes, endowed by the Creator with dignity and rights. A devout Catholic, he practiced what he preached. His faith consistently dictated his actions. Following the First World War, after the Treaty of Trianon, which truncated the Kingdom of Hungary, Eszterházy, without moving house, found himself in a newly created Czechoslovak state, soon renamed Czechoslovakia. Naturally, he favored the restitution of pre-war Hungary and worked toward that end. He also protected his fellow Magyars and defended their rights. Further, his views on non-Catholics were distinctly pre-Vatican II, of course. Extra ecclesia nulla salus. There is no salvation outside of the church. In addition, the Count firmly believed in supporting Christian economic endeavors to break the traditional Jewish monopoly on trade and other pursuits. This in turn led to his backing of anti-Jewish legislation, which was horrible. All this unfortunately was very much mainstream across Europe, including particularly in the Intermarium. This was the gist of his beliefs. 
He was promptly elected to the parliament in Prague. He took it upon himself to champion the Hungarian minority, but he also looked out for the rights of the German minority. Both faced certain discrimination and hardships in the newly independent state where those nationalities used to enjoy a privileged status under the Habsburgs. One can say that freshly emancipated Czechs and Slovaks tended to take it out on the Hungarians and Germans. This by no means was full-fledged persecution, but rather bureaucratic drudgery and mild harassment by the standards of the day. But then history accelerated. Early on, the overbearing Czechs pushed down their erstwhile Slovak partners who felt embittered and cheated out of the fruits of power. In the 1930s, the Czechoslovak state found itself under pressure from the outside. Hitler's Third Reich threatened war and demanded a chunk of the Czechoslovak territory, the Sudetenland. Despite fielding Europe's most advanced technologically army and boasting of the continent's arguably most formidable border fortifications, the Czechs caved. Their leaders resolved that freedom was not worth fighting for. They gave up without firing a shot. Hungary reclaimed a sliver of Czechoslovakia and also Poland foolishly recovered the Czechian, Czechian, Czechian Silesia, which the Czechs had seized with its Polish majority during Poland's struggle against Soviet Russia in 1919-1921. I say Poland's actions were foolish, not because the Poles were not within their right to recoup Czechian, but because the timing was lousy. It was in Warsaw's interest to support Prague's resistance to Germany. But because the Czechs surrendered cravenly, they also abdicated their duty to protect their own citizens from the German occupier. The Polish government thus felt justified in preventing ethnic Poles of Czechoslovakia from falling under the Nazi boot. Hence, it incorporated the Czechian Silesia without firing a shot and to a great enthusiasm of the Polish majority, which had not enjoyed the Czech overlordship. Soon, however, Hitler simply gobbled up the remnant of the Czechoslovak state. He turned the Czech lands, Bohemia and Moravia, into an obedient protectorate. And he allowed the disgruntled Slovaks to set up their own republic, in fact, a puppet state of the Third Reich. Its leader was Monsignor Josef Tisho, a Catholic priest. A shame. Once again, without moving, Count Esterhazy found himself a citizen of a new state. He transferred from the no longer existing democratic legislature in Prague to the rubber stamp parliament in Bratislava. He was elected like before by his own constituency and there is no reason to suspect any tricks on his side, even though Slovakia wide elections were rigged by the new government. He, he didn't have to cheat. His Hungarians faithfully flocked to the polls to elect him. Like in the, in the Prague legislature, he was not going to okay anything that conflicted with his conscience. His mission remained the same, help the weak, assist the minorities. Numerous times he spoke out in defense of the Hungarian minority, which experienced more severe harassment in the puppet state of Slovakia than it had in interwar Czechoslovakia. But he also appealed to the Hungarian head of state, Admiral Miklos Horty de Neusbanya, to desist from persecution of Slovaks on his side of the border. He further used his perch, his perch in and out of the parliament to speak out on the burning issues of the day. For example, in the spring of 1943, in a fiery speech, Eszterházy roundly condemned Stalin and the Soviet Union as the perpetrators of the hideous Katyn Forest Massacre. This was a part of the genocidal operation to exterminate Polish elites, which in this instance culminated in the murder of about 25, 20, maybe 28,000 uh, Poles, mostly allied POW officers. Let's make it clear. Hitler's best ally, Stalin, exterminated 
allied pro-Western POW officers. Yet arguably, the, the Count's greatest moment came on May 15, 1942, when he stood up in the parliament, he denounced the government's plans to get rid of Slovakia's Jews. Esther Hazy was the only deputy to have cast a dissenting vote against the measure. Everyone knew that deportation really meant death in Auschwitz. Only the count loudly objected. Reportedly, he turned to the collaborationist Monsignor Tiso and told him, our sign is the cross and not the swastika. He repeated it often during the war. All the while, the Hungarian parliamentarian was involved in various illegal activities. He ran an underground railroad for Polish clandestine couriers and fugitives, including future commander in chief of the Polish Free Army in exile, General Kazimierz Sosunkowski. The count even transported persons like him in his car, taking full advantage of parliamentary immunity. He delivered them to Hungary, where they were usually free to pass to the West. He further interceded on the behalf of Polish clandestine operators captured in Slovakia, and sometimes he was able to secure their release. He also uh, procured false papers and passports for the victims of the Third Reich, including Jews. For his opposition to the German rule, he was arrested by the collaborationist Hungarian Air Cross government in 19 in October 1944. He managed to get out, then the Gestapo put him on its wanted list. In 1944, like in 1938 and after, his friends insisted on facilitating Esther Hazi's escape to the West. He had the money, he had friends, he had the means, he could have gone to Switzerland. His response, however, was always that he would not leave his wife and children or his people behind. When the Red Army pushed the Wehrmacht out of his homeland, the Count proceeded to intervene with the, uh, with the Soviets uh, against rape, terror, and deportations to the Gulag. That was unacceptable to the communists. In 1945, Stalin's secret police promptly arrested him and shipped him off to Siberia as a class enemy. In the camps, Esther Hazi became renowned for his piety and help to prisoners. They referred to him as Padre and could not believe he was not, in fact, the priest. Meanwhile, the Soviet-backed National Council in Slovakia tried him in abstention in absentia and found him guilty of treason for allegedly collaborating with the Nazis. This was a standard and automatic punishment for anyone participating in the rubber stamp parliament. However, Edward Benesch, the president of the reinstituted Liberal Democratic Republic of Czechoslovakia promptly commuted the sentence. In 1948, the communists staged a coup, installing a totalitarian dictatorship in Czechoslovakia. For them, of course, the count remained an enemy of the people. A year later, the Soviets transferred Esther Hazi from the Gulag to a red jail in Prague. He was tortured, tormented, and maltreated. His health deteriorated, and the Count died in the prison hospital in Prague in 1957. He was not yet 60 years old. He was buried in, a, in secret in a mass grave. No one, no one was supposed to remember, yet his family did, and a few friends. His story lived on in whispered conversations among the Hungarian minority in Czechoslovakia, but also in Poland. Then came the break of 1989 and the case of Janos Ester Hazi resurfaced. A clamor went up for justice. The Russians rehabilitated him for the crimes he did not commit in 1993. The Poles decorated him with the coveted Polonia Restituta Cross in 2009. There is a minor cult of him in Hungary and among Slovak Hungarians. The Vatican, meanwhile, pronounced him servant of God. The Count's beatification process is underway. Rome will probably make him a saint because there is, before there is any justice in Prague and Bratislava. And that is 
something considering a usually glacial pace of the Holy See. Santo subito, Janos Esterhazy. Unfortunately, neither the Czechs nor the Slovaks have moved to lift the odium of treason and alleged Nazi collaboration from the underdog. Let's make one thing clear. The Czechs and Slovaks have a valid point. The Count was not loyal to either the Czechoslovak or Slovak state. He was loyal to the Kingdom of Hungary where he was born and that had existed in his Slovak homeland for a thousand years before then. He and others like him were left behind after its radical truncation at Trianon. They lost their country. Honor and patriotism demanded that they not countenance the new Czechoslovak reality. In an analogous situation in 1937, my father was born in Poland's Vilno, which the Lithuanians call Vilnius. After his parents were arrested by the Soviets, his grandfather fled with him to central Poland, thus essentially saving him from a communist orphanage, which would have meant denationalization and communization, if not death. Both his parents were charged with treason to the Soviet Union. Why? They both were with the pro-Western Polish underground home army in Vilno. They opposed both the Nazis and communists. Unwillingly, they found themselves under their and their collaborators' jurisdiction. In fact, the home, their home city changed hands five times between 1939 and 1945. First, in September 1939, their Vilno was taken by the Soviets. In October, Stalin handed it over to Lithuanians. In June 1940, the USSR annexed Lithuania, including Vilno. A year later, the Third Reich attacked the Soviet Union and occupied Vilno. In July 1944, the Red Army returned to Gobla, Poland's Vilno, for good. For having fought in the resistance against the Germans and for continuing their underground activities under the Soviets, both my grandparents were charged with treason to the Soviet Union. Stalin simply considered them Soviet citizens. They never asked for and never approved of such an affliction. Preserving all proportions, neither did Count Janos Esterhazy. The question, therefore, is not whether Esterhazy was disloyal to Czechoslovakia. How could he have been? He was heir to a millennial kingdom of Hungary which was suddenly partitioned and the Count found himself under what he considered to be a foreign occupation. How can one betray a state that occupies one's own country illegally? Clearly, it is impossible. Happily, Russia does not persist in considering my grandparents traitors and enemies of the people. It's time to apply the same yardstick to our saintly hero. Bratislava and Prague should, so Moscow understood this. Bratislava and Prague should understand that as well. If the Russians got it, the Czechs and Slovaks should get it too. They should also reflect that by refusing justice to Eshterhazy, they are first allowing the verdict of a Soviet backed kangaroo court to stand. And second, they are countenancing the torture, imprisonment, and ultimately death of the Count by the communists. This must stop. There are other ways to express one's displeasure at his Magyar, Magyar irredentism. Reducing him to a Nazi collaborator is mendacious and thus besmirches the current democratic credentials of Czechia and Slovakia. As far as restoring the, mar the martyr's good name, there has been virtually no official assistance from those states. It took an informal intervention of a fellow aristocrat, Prince Karl von Schwarzenberg, who served for a while as Czechia's foreign minister, even to get the bureaucrats to reveal Esther Haas's Esther has his prison burial place, and it didn't happen till the 21st century. Before then, the family could not have mourned him properly. Uh, but 
Both successor governments refused to rehabilitate him and to clear his name. Perhaps the best idea to end this nonsense is to enlist Israel's help. Like the Americans, the Jewish people also can identify an underdog. In Slovakia, Esther Hazy was the only one who defended them when it really mattered. That must count for something. Simon Wiesenthal himself recognized that and sang the Magyar aristocrats high praises. And so does Hungary's Jewish community. If international pressure is applied, at least knowing the Czechs, they should cave. This time, it would be out of decency, however. Thank you very much.